Hello everyone, I am Dr. Akshar Rajul Thorwath, working as Associate Professor in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering, Kolhapur Institute of Technologies, College of Engineering Autonomous, Kolhapur. So, I welcome you all for this lesson number 2 on the topic quantity of sewage. So, in this session, we will learn about the considerations for the type of system. So, how to select a particular system, sewage system. So, we will learn the factors which are affecting the selection of the type of system and along with that, we will also learn about the quantity of sewage, how to quantify the sewage. So, we will learn about that. So, to begin with, here you can see, first of all, let us discuss some of the considerations for the selection of type of system. So, earlier we have studied three types of sewage systems, separate system, combined system and partially separate system. So, in separate system, two types of conduits are required or two types of sewers are required. First one, which is required to collect the sanitary sewage from the different areas, maybe from residential areas and industrial areas. And the second conduit or second sewer, which is to collect the storm water from the roofs and the streets. Whereas in combined sewer, we have seen that there is single conduit or single sewer is required where we combine sanitary sewage and storm water. And in case of partially separate system, we can collect the sanitary sewage and part of the uh, storm water in the single sewer and the separate sewer is provided to collect the rest of the part of the storm water. So, that is why in selection of type of system, the number of conduits plays very important role. So, based on that, we can decide whether we should go for separate system, combined system or partially separate system. Then second point or second consideration is type of area. So, the type of area which is required to be served that is also important factor based on which we can decide the type of system. Then third point is self cleansing velocity. As we know that we are supposed to maintain minimum possible velocity of flow in the sewer line so that there will not be any silting problem or there will not be any deposition at any of the section. So, in order to achieve this, we are supposed to maintain the minimum possible velocity which is known as self cleansing velocity. So, this is also important to identify the type of system. Then next one is cost of pumping. Now, as we know that in separate system, only sewage is required to be pumped and it is taken to the sewage treatment plant where it is treated and then it is disposed of. So, only the sanitary sewage is required to be pumped in case of separate sewers whereas in case of combined sewers we are supposed to collect or we are supposed to pump the sanitary sewage as well as storm water. So, the quantity of pump uh, says uh, quantity of flow which is required to be pumped that is more in case of combined sewer. That is why cost of pumping in case of combined sewer is more than cost of pumping in case of separate sewer. The next point is quantity of wastewater to be treated. So, again similar to the previous point in separate system, we are supposed to only treat the sanitary sewage where in case of separate sewers, but in case of combined sewers as we are mixing sanitary sewage and storm water. So, the quantity of wastewater which is required to be treated at sewage treatment plant is more. So, that is why the cost of treatment will be also more in case of combined sewers and cost of treatment in case of separate sewer will be less. And last point which is considered to identify the type of system is the site conditions. So, what is the topography of the site? What is the gradient? So, based on that, based on the site conditions, we can identify the typical type of system, sewage system we can say for that particular area. So, these are some of the factors affecting the selection of type of system. Now, moving to the next part, let us discuss more about the quantity of sewage. So, how to quantify the sewage? So, already we have studied that sewage is nothing but it is the sludge plus uh, say waste water which is generated from various sources okay? and it also includes the human excreta. So, that is the sewage. Now, how to quantify this sewage? So, here you can see one term we are using dry weather flow. There are two terms dry weather flow and wet weather flow. We will discuss in detail about those particular terms. So, dry weather flow nothing but it is that quantity of waste water that flows through a sewer in dry weather conditions when no storm water in, is in the sewer. So, we consider only the sanitary sewage and we do not consider the storm water in this particular case. So, sanitary sewage or sanitary flow that is nothing but dry weather flow. It includes domestic waste water from different houses such as sources from water closets, bathrooms, urinals, wash basins, etc. Along with that, we also consider the industrial wastewater, then wastewater generated from public facilities as well as we consider groundwater infiltration. We will be also learning about how to find out the infiltration quantity 
or infiltration flow we will discuss that in detail in the further slides so these are the uh, sources which are considered for finding out the dry weather flow we do not consider the storm water flow in this now the flow of sanitary sewage alone in the absence of storm in dry season is known as dry weather flow as i mentioned therefore quantity of dry weather flow is equal to per capita sewage contributed per day into population so basically what happens initially suppose we are supposed to find out the population of the city we are supposed to uh, predict the uh, population of the city at the certain design period and based on that we are uh, supposed to identify what is the average water demand of that particular city based on that average water supply or average water demand we are supposed to find out how much quantity of sewage is generated so generally 70 to 80 percent of total water supplied is converted into sewage so we are supposed to consider that particular quantity so that is the average quantity on per capita basis multiplying it by total population you will get total average quantity or average flow of sewage now the factors which are affecting this dry weather flow are rate of water supply so rate at which water is supplied to the city or to the town or to certain areas so that is very important because as i mentioned out of that total water supplied around 70 to 80 percent of water is converted into sewage then population growth see when we are designing such kind of systems we are supposed to project the future population so that's why we consider the design period concept design period nothing but it is the future period for which the system and the various components are designed and the capacities are found out so we are supposed to project for how much period that particular system that particular infrastructure or the, those particular components are going to serve the purpose and based on that we are supposed to forecast the population so there are different methods of forecasting the population so we are supposed to identify that population growth and based on that we are supposed to design the system then type of area to be served and the infiltration of groundwater so infiltration of groundwater nothing but what basically when uh, sewers are laid underground in that case if those sewers are having some faulty joints or if there are some cracks so what happens if there is a presence of groundwater above the uh, sewer line in that case that groundwater will percolate through the faulty joints and cracks and that is the additional quantity which is added in the uh, sewage so infiltration is also additional quantity which is added in the sewage and that is required to be considered in finding out the quantity of sewage so these are the factors affecting the dry weather conditions or dry weather flow now some of the other terms like average sewage flow so it is calculated from the total water consumption and the population of that area once the design period is completed for example for a particular town if i assume that the design period is 30 years so after 30 years what will be the forecasted population i am going to identify that one then i am going to find out what is the average demand of that particular town so suppose if it is 150 liters per capita per day per capita per day nothing but per person per day requirement so if there is a demand of 150 liters per capita per day into suppose forecasted population is 1 lakh so at a particular design period whatever population is forecasted that population into average demand i am going to find out the total uh, water quantity which is required to be supplied or the total water quantity which is demanded by that particular town and out of that 70 to 80 percent will be converted into sewage so that i am going to consider it as average sewage flow because we are finding out it from average daily demand okay then second one peak sewage flow so here one important terminology is there that is peaking factor so peak sewage flow nothing but here we are considering peaking factor which is nothing but uh, it is it is a term which is used to forecast the maximum or peaking flows for the new proposed design capacity and it is the ratio between maximum sewage flow to average daily sewage flow so based on that peaking factor we are finding out the maximum flow or peaking flow for a new or proposed design capacity then wet weather flow it is the flow during or immediately after a storm and it is higher than the dry weather flows due to direct inflow into the systems so these are some of the terminologies now the next point subtractions uh, allowance now the next point is subtractions allowance so it includes water used for drinking after washing clothes quantity evaporated in drying sprinkling and gardening of roads 
parks, gardens, etc. So as I mentioned that around 70 to 80 percent of water is converted into sewage. So rest of the water may be utilized for other purposes. So we consider those as subtraction losses. So it includes water which is used for drinking apart from the other uh, uses. Also it includes water loss due to vestiges and leakages in the pipeline during distribution. So whatever distribution system we uh, utilize. So in that distribution system, there may be some leakages, there may be some vestiges. So we also consider these leakages and vestiges in this subtraction allowance. Then the total allowance for subtraction in the total quantity of water supplied is taken between 20% to 30% of the total supply. That's why from total quantity supplied, we deduct this 20 to 30 percent and that's why we consider 70 to 80 percent water converted into sewage. The next, so here you can see, this is the table which shows the recommended values of water consumption and the sewage produced for the cities in India. So here the population per capita demand in liters per day and how much sewage is produced uh, per capita basis in liters per day that has been shown. So, for example, if the population is up to 50,000, then in general, we assume that the per capita demand in liters per day is 135 liters per capita per day. So, it is per capita per day. So, 135 liters out of which around 70 to 80 percent of that supplied water is converted to sewage. So, sewage produce is around 115 liters per capita per day. So, if you multiply this number 115 by the population, then we get the average daily uh, uh, sewage flow for that particular town. So, like that for different population ranges or class intervals, these per capita demands have been shown and sewage produce has been shown in this particular table. Now, next point is infiltration. So, as I mentioned earlier that when the sewers are laid below the water table in the ground, the ground water may percolate in the sewers from the faulty joints and cracks in the pipeline. So, there may be possibility that over a period of time, there may be some faulty joints are there, there may be uh, some cracks which are developed in the sewers and through that, if there is a presence of groundwater table, then that groundwater will percolate through the cracks or joints. So, that is the infiltration through these particular faulty joints and cracks. So, that is additional quantity which is considered and the quantity of this infiltration water in the sewers will, is depend upon the factors such as the height of the water table above the sewers, then what is the permeability of the soil, then size and nature of the faults or cracks in the sewer line. So, these are the factors which are considered in order to find out the infiltration quantity. Here also you can see that the quantity of infiltration water varies from 2800 to 5 lakh liters per day per kilometer length of the sewer line and there are various ways of uh, considering the infiltration quantity. So, you can see here some of the examples I have shown. So, in some of the cases we consider as 4.5 to 45 cubic meter per hectare area per day. So, it is the unit is cubic meter per hectare area per day. In another case, we consider 11 to 225 cubic meter per hectare area per kilometer length of the sewer line. So, in previous case, we consider per day basis. Second, we consider per kilometer length basis. Then third point is 0.7 to 7.2 cubic meter per day per centimeter diameter of the sewer. Along with that, you can see the table where I have given the uh, different uh, say quantity or quantities of infiltration water. So, for catchment area of the sewer line, if it is in bit, uh, for the catchment area of the sewer line, we consider 5000 to 50,000 liters per day per hectare. Then length of sewer line, we consider 500 to 5000 liters per day per kilometer of sewer per centimeter diameter and manholes, we consider 250 to 500 liters per day per manhole. Now, next point is storm water. So, this is another factor which is considered in the sewage uh, quantity. For example, in case of combined sewer, we are supposed to find out quantity of sewage from various sources, infiltration as well as storm water quantity. So, whenever we come across the combined system, in that case, we are supposed to find out the storm water quantity also. So, how to find out that storm water quantity? So, here you can see we are using the rational formula for areas which are less than 0.5 km square. So, the formula is given as QP is equal to 1 upon 360 CR into IC into A, where QP is the estimated design discharge which is in QMEC, nothing but cubic meter per second. Then CR is the composite runoff coefficient which is unitless parameter for the watershed. So, when there is a rainfall, there will be some runoff. So, depending upon the type of surface, 
this runoff will vary. So, how much quantity of rainfall is available in the form of runoff? So, that we find out. So, CR is the composite runoff coefficient based on which we do the further calculation. So, here the average runoff coefficient is needs to be identified. For example, one certain town may have different types of surfaces like roofs are there, pavements are there, then open, uh, open courtyards are there, then gardens, vegetation cover, forest areas. So, different surfaces are there. So, these different surfaces are having different coefficients, runoff coefficients. So, depending upon that, we are supposed to find out average runoff coefficient and that is required to be used in the formula. Then IC is nothing but maximum rainfall intensity which is expressed in terms of mm per hour in the geographic region of interest and A is called as watershed area which is in hectares. So, these are the parameters which are used in the formula, rational formula and the, ST, no, the design discharge is calculated. Here you can see this is the table which shows the runoff coefficient for various types of surfaces like for example, forest and wooden areas. So, the runoff coefficient is taken around 0.0. Uh, 0 0.1 to 0 0.20, then open grounds, unpaved streets and railroad yards, so 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 and so on. So, for different types of surfaces, these runoff coefficients have been given, so we can directly use these particular values depending upon the type of surface. Another table has been shown in this next slide, so you can see runoff coefficient for various types of localities. For example, here the type of locality has been shown, approximate average density of population is also given and the runoff coefficient is given. For example, extreme suburban uh, areas, thinly populated. So, the population density is around 12 to 20. So, here runoff coefficient is taken as 0 0.35. For suburban areas with detached houses, we consider population density around 20 to 40. So, the runoff coefficient is 0 0.45 to 0 0.55 and so on. So, depending upon the type of localities, we also consider the runoff coefficient. Now, one more uh, way is there for finding out the maximum rainfall intensity in mm per hour. Sometimes, uh, we do not have the exact value of the maximum rainfall intensity. We have the time of concentration. So, when the time of concentration is known or it is given, which is nothing but the longest time required for a particle to travel from the watershed divide to the watershed outlet. That is called as time of concentration. It is also known as duration of storm. So, when time of concentration is given, in that case, we are finding out this maximum rainfall intensity using formula 25.4 into A divided by Tc plus B, where A and B, these are the constants. A and B are the constants and Tc is the time of concentration, which is nothing but longest time required for a particle to travel from the watershed divide to the watershed outlet. Now, here you can see when time of concentration is in between 5 to 20 minutes, we take A as 30 and B as 10. These are the standard coefficients or standard constants. And when time of concentration is in between 20 to 100 minutes, we take A as 40 and B as 20. So, using these values, we can find out the maximum rainfall intensity when time of concentration is given. So, these are the references. Thank you very much.